Hello, my name is J.D. Stillwater. I'm a science ambassador and culture shifter. And today I want to speak to you in a presentation I've entitled Nature's Scripture, the Interfaith Promise of Science. And I'm really glad to be here. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. I think most people who consider themselves spiritual or religious have some source, some kind of sacred text that they refer to for insight and for guidance. But those texts are all different, right? People of goodwill all over the world are doing their best to reach across theological and scriptural divides. But what if there were no scriptural divides? Or in other words, what if there were a common scripture that was shared by all religions? I've done my best in this talk to use language and imagery that's inclusive of everyone. And the fact is, I'm an old cis white guy from the United States. So if you could see ways that I could be more inclusive, please let me know in the comments or, or um, through other people at the Theosophical Society so that I can improve and get better at this. Theosophists are really good at finding the common threads between the world's spiritual and faith traditions. And I'm here to offer one more, a globally shared common scripture that includes all the others by its very nature. Scripture. You know, my coworker brought a CD version of the Holy Scripture to work the other day, and he got upset when I asked if I could burn a copy of it. There's nothing like a good joke, and that was nothing like a good joke. <laughs> but, but it brings up an important point about what we mean by a Holy Scripture or a sacred text. Pagan priestess Starhawk once wrote that something is sacred when there is no end, no goal that would justify its destruction or desecration. If you like that approach, it suggests that sacred texts describe things or ideas that must be protected, revered, cherished. Well, this summer I learned about a podcast called Harry Potter and the Sacred Text. So a Harvard Divinity student named Vanessa Zoltan began studying the classic fiction book Jane Eyre as though it were a sacred scripture, just to see what spiritual meaning she could glean from it. And she and her professor were astounded at how beneficial that was. So the effort grew into a study group using the Harry Potter books as though they were sacred texts. It became a podcast, and now, eight years later, 16 million people have benefited spiritually from studying Harry Potter books as though they were scripture. And that's in spite of J.K. Rowling's dismaying transphobia and anti-Semitism. Their point is not that Harry Potter is a sacred text. It isn't. They chose it because it's well known and because there's a lot going on in the story's plot. I mention it because I think if this can work with Harry Potter, of all things, it could work with almost any text. What they're doing is exegesis, which means interpretation of a text, usually sacred texts. And Vanessa and her team say, they say this in big, bold type on their website, we believe that in treating texts as sacred, we can learn to treat one another as sacred. And they emphasize that this works, again, with Harry Potter, it works because of three things, trust, rigor, and community. Trust that the text can yield generous rewards. Rigor, well, here's how they put it, quote, the text in and of itself is not sacred, but it is made so through our rigorous engagement with it, end quote. And community in that it takes a village to be uplifted together, to make holy meaningfulness from a text that's studied in community. And as I understand it, this theosophical community does these all the time, intuitively. So if millions of people can extract spiritual enrichment from studying the Harry Potter books, then if we had a global text that we all regarded as sacred, what miracles could arise from interfaith dialogue on it, especially if we studied it with trust, rigor, and community? I think the world might be very different. If we had a common scripture, different people would probably make different meanings from it, and, and that's okay. 
As you know, the billions of people who study the Hebrew book of Genesis have lots of different takes on the role of women, for example. All right, I can't resist. What did God say after creating Adam? She said, I can do better than that. <laughs> but um, what's not funny is how some in this country's history use Genesis to justify slavery. And some people still think that way. So clearly, the same text can sometimes yield vastly different interpretations. So a common scripture doesn't necessarily prevent misuse of it or guarantee religious reconciliation, but it might help. And at the very least, we could have some shared holidays and we would have a common language for addressing challenges from personal challenges to global crises. At heart, Religious scriptures are about spiritual experience. So take a moment, just close your eyes, and remember a time when you felt profoundly spiritually inspired, or totally at peace, or deeply connected. Take a few deep breaths and put yourself back there. Remember where you were and how you felt. Just take a moment to remember that experience. And when you're ready, open your eyes and take another deep breath. When I ask people to share about their spiritual experiences like this, almost always they describe something that happened in a natural or a wilderness setting, or an experience that was deeply connected with something or someone outside themselves, or both, connective experience in nature. Here's the big reveal. We do have a common global scripture, and you have been living and worshiping in its pages your whole life, perhaps never considering its spiritual potential, its sacred depths. It is tremendously rich in theological content. We might disagree about the divine provenance of one another's traditional scriptures, but this one we know to have been directly, personally written by the Creator however we experience or perceive or name that ultimate source. Our common scripture is nature, creation, natural reality, a vast cosmos we now know to be at least 47 billion light years across, a universe that includes all of us on Earth, along with uncountable other Earths. Did you know there are more solar systems in the visible universe than there are grains of sand on Earth. Let that sink in. There are more solar systems in the universe than there are grains of sand on the Earth. Astronomer Neil deGrasse Tyson says, we are a speck on a speck on a speck on a speck. Really, really small. One of those pictures, this one, is a photograph of Earth taken by Voyager 1 from beyond the orbit of Neptune. Your entire life and all of human history, all of evolution took place on that tiny speck. Carl Sagan described it as a pale blue dot suspended in a sunbeam, a speck. Imagine if your own holy scripture, whatever that is, contained a sentence like this one. The sun is a fire bigger than a million earths, and there are more suns in the heavens than grains of sand on earth. What meaning would you make of that as you studied it? How does it feel to contemplate that? Does it expand your feelings about who or what could have created such a cosmos? Now imagine that that sentence isn't just a sentence in a book recorded by a revered prophet long ago, but a present day reality you can see with your own eyes. Imagine that anyone can see it and engage with you about what it means to them, how they feel knowing it. How do you feel knowing this? When I ask that question in my workshops, I most often hear two sentiments. People feel awe, or they feel really small and insignificant. Me too. It's humbling. We are so small. A bit of humility might be just what we need at this time in history. Hmm? 
Often in nature, there's a counterbalance, and that's true here, too. As far as we know, the only complex life in the entire universe is here on Earth. Two trillion galaxies of stars, and this tiny dot of a planet may have the only eyes, the only hearts, the only love, the only minds to appreciate it all. So, are you a speck, or are you precious beyond measure? Science just describes, and in that regard, it's a text. It doesn't tell us what it means or what to make of it. Science concerns itself with what is. It's up to each of us to determine what it means. Human beings are hardwired for making meaning. We can't avoid it. We think in metaphors and analogies. So when we're doing science, it's crucial that we stick as closely as possible to the raw facts. And it's really important not to confuse our models and metaphors with reality itself. But make no mistake, meaning will be made from new knowledge, one way or another. When scientists and science writers insist that the cosmos is devoid of meaning, well, they might be right, but at best, they leave a void that will get filled with something. And at worst, I think they encourage people to reject science altogether because our guts tell us that nothing is completely meaningless. So, am I a mere speck or precious in thy sight? I say both. For me, being both minuscule and precious instills a durable humility, along with a sense of responsibility. It says, I'm not in control here. And what I do really matters. I'm a terribly small part of something incomprehensibly vast. And nevertheless, I'm an essential part. In 2017, I was fortunate to travel to Oregon's Central Desert with a group of students to see the Great American Eclipse. I knew it would be a cool astronomical event, but I had no idea. The experience was ineffable, and my attempts to describe it always fall short, but I'm going to try one more time here. There was a feeling of excitement when the moon made first contact with the sun's disk and then began devouring it bit by bit. It happened slowly over about an hour, a time spent just brimming with anticipation. And gradually the light around us dimmed, not suddenly or obviously, but the whole world began to look thin, papery, kind of two-dimensional. And then it was dark. Not midnight dark. The horizon looked like early dawn, but all around us, not just in the east. Stars twinkled clear and bright right overhead, and tendrils of misty light streamed out from the ominous black disk where the sun should have been and was just moments before. I was intensely aware that the misty light I was seeing from the sun's corona traced this laser-straight line of conscious connection from my eye up through the atmosphere, just skimming the edge of the moon and reaching all the way out to the sun, drawing me into their primordial dance, a dance that conjoins space and time and marries dynamism with stillness and connects descendants with ancestors. But all of this, these were not thoughts in my head. I felt all of that all at once, like, I don't know, maybe like a cool shower on a hot afternoon. It was overwhelming. It was breathtaking. It was beautiful. And then it was over. Those two minutes of totality were painfully short. I remember exhaling and discovering that I was sobbing with joy and awe. If you get a chance to see a total solar eclipse, take it. It's a profound spiritual experience. And for those in North America, the next total eclipse here is on April 8th, just a few months from now, and then no more for 20 years. So don't miss it. Richard Louvre says, all spiritual life begins with a sense of wonder. I've spent many years now collecting and cataloging awe-inspiring wonders of natural reality. I've been calling them revelations because they get revealed as scientists do their work. And even if we had a thousand hours for this presentation, I could barely scratch the surface of all of them. 
but I want to touch on a few more. Bring to mind a prophet or a teacher at the root of your faith tradition, someone like Moses, Confucius, or Buddha, someone like that. You have someone in mind? Now, take a deep breath with me. You just breathed in over 13 sextillion air molecules in one breath. But here's the thing. Over 700 million of those molecules were also, at some point, inside the lungs of the prophet or teacher that you were thinking of. The same is true of everyone who ever lived more than a few decades ago. That breath also included air molecules from every animal that ever lived, every plant that ever lived. They're all right there in the atmosphere of your room with you. Now, knowing all that, take another breath. Feels different, doesn't it? Some of the oxygen molecules you breathed in a moment ago now are you. They're part of your body. Millions of them have come alive by being part of you. There are more solar systems than grains of sand on Earth, and there are more water molecules in one tablespoon of water than all the stars and sand grains combined. Air and water molecules are so small and so numerous, and they cycle around the Earth so constantly that every cup of beverage you swallow contains over 150 million water molecules that actually passed through Jesus' body during his lifetime. If your prophet or guru lived more than about 35 years old, then it's even more than 150 million molecules in every cup of beverage you'll ever drink. That's the science. Now, what does it mean? To me, it means that all water is holy water. And when I consider that as I drink, it connects me with all the ancestors on this dynamic living planet and with the holiness that infuses every moment I'm alive. Here again, it orients me integrally within a stream of flowing matter and energy far greater than myself and my daily struggles. When I meditate on science revelations like this and interpret them like the chapters of a religious text, some consistent fibers stand out for me, almost like golden threads in nature's tapestry. I see patterns that have meaning not only for me personally, but that offer to help heal a wounded society on a critically ill planet. I've been calling them the insights, and I just want to skim through three of them. First, let me say that what I'm about to share is partly science and partly exegesis. It's interpretive meaning-making from the findings of science. Somebody else might look at the same science knowledge and interpret it differently. Unity. The kind of genetic testing being done routinely now makes clear that every human being on the planet is a distant cousin. The people watching this are all cousins. It's a family reunion of sorts. How do we greet a cousin we've never met that turns up at a family reunion? Try this next time you meet someone new. Instead of the boring old, hi, so-and-so, nice to meet you. Instead say, Hello, cousin. I'm so glad to finally meet you. Their puzzled look will be an opening for you to talk about theosophy. Of course, we're not just talking about people who are easy to know and get along with. I'm also talking about the panhandler I ignored yesterday and world leaders I regard as evil and the guy who cut me off on the road and people with unfamiliar ways. Those are my cousins, too. This does not thrill me. It's not all sweetness and light. I don't like that the water I drink has been part of people who do awful things, too. Revelations are not always comfortable. And that's true of most sacred scriptures, right? Discomfort is part of the spiritual journey. Our choice is to face the truth of it or to live in a superficial denial of reality itself, right? All humans are cousins. Every conflict is a family conflict. Every war is a civil war. Recognizing this, for me, has been profoundly spiritual. 
And this deep kinship doesn't stop with people. Those same genetic tests and many other lines of evidence reveal that every living thing on this planet is blood related, even the ones with nothing like blood, and really not all that distant from me and my human cousins. This is my 304,325,256 cousin, 110,385,693 times removed. Her name is Olivia. She has a successful career in the recycling industry, and she's always been kind to me. She is celebrating because she found the perfect ball of feces to raise her children in. I can't wait to meet my new baby cousins. Sitting aside, the tree of life is a family tree with branches for every living thing on this planet. This is not just someone's conjecture. There's overwhelming evidence that this is a fact, and we can map out precise relationships based on genetic variations. We humans are neither the root nor the apex of the tree of life. We're just one leaflet on one small branch. That's the science. Now, what meaning are we going to make from that? How will we treat our kin? And it's not just living things either. Here on Earth, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the lithosphere, these are interconnected, inseparable systems. And we live on and inside them. They flow through us. Rocks dissolve in water and get washed to the ocean, then become seashells, then bird bones or rocks again. River becomes ocean, then cloud, then apple, then human, then air. Everything, everywhere, all at once, up, down, across and around, with interconnections and shortcuts and cycles within cycles. Here on Earth, all boundaries and distinctions are either arbitrary or temporary. Earth is one thing, not separate from us, or even separable into distinct parts. One living Earth organism. Earth's matter flows through me, minute by minute, coming from elsewhere on the planet and going on to other adventures after being me. Until recently, I used the word interdependence for this, but it's never felt quite adequate. We are not separate objects that depend on trading materials and energy with other objects. We are integral elements of a larger whole. I am the water cycle and the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, like my blood and bones are my body. They're not all of it, but they're not separable from it either. So a few months ago, I learned this word interbeing as used by Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh. I think interbeing fits better. I'm not a distinct but interdependent object. I exist as an integral interbeing with and as a living planet. And interbeing extends beyond Earth, too. Every atom on Earth came from somewhere, and now we know where. All the atoms heavier than hydrogen and helium were forged inside the furnaces of exploding supernova stars. Stars make all those other elements out of hydrogen and helium. Remember, this is the origins of our bodies we're talking about. Did you know that the main elements in your body are in the same order of abundance as elements in the universe as a whole? Except for helium and neon, they don't play very well with others, and they're extremely rare on Earth. I want to show you a short clip about this. I know that the molecules in my body are traceable to phenomena in the cosmos. And that, and it's our 15 pounds of gray matter that figured this out. There's a kinship with the cosmos that resonates deeply with new age thinking, but I'm not apologetic about that. It's what we find. If whatever we find is resonates with whoever, go ahead, take it. And when I reflect on our kinship with the cosmos, when I do the calculation that shows that a 15-ton meteorite that we have in the center of the Rose Center for Earth and Space, it's an iron meteorite. When I do the calculation that shows that if you take all of the iron from the hemoglobin of the people in the tri-state area of New York City, you can recover that much iron out of their blood and realize that the iron from that meteorite and the iron from your blood has common origin in the core of a star. 
tell me what part of my brain is lighting up because that excites me. That makes me want to grab people in the street and say, have you heard this? Your body is a microcosm of the cosmos. You are a reflection of the whole, acting within the whole for the whole. And going back further, we now also know where the first atoms of hydrogen and helium came from. They came from light. Those first atoms condensed out of intense light energy at the beginning of time in a process called Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Gravity later collected those atoms together to make stars, which later exploded to make heavy atoms, which gravity then collected again to make planets. So taken in context with lots of other passages from the scripture of nature, to me, this means that my family tree goes all the way back to the dawn of time, and I am interbeing with everything in the universe. We are the universe, come alive, in a state of total unity with all of it. Beyond that, my body is made out of light. It took a while, but still, that's where it came from. And centuries before modern cosmological science, the Islamic poet Rumi said it this way, you are not a drop in the ocean. You are the entire ocean in a drop. Cooperation. When I was a kid, my parents were Shackley distributors, which meant that for us kids, a treat was a Shackley energy bar. And believe me, these things were nothing like candy. And one day I noticed that a colony of ants had chewed a hole in the wrapper of an energy bar that had fallen unnoticed under a radiator in my parents' office. And to their credit, my parents treated it as a science project and they let the ants eat. And those ants were fascinating to me. I spent hours on my belly watching them day after day, noticing how they walked in thin lines, almost like highways, complete with passing lanes and how they always touched antennae with each other as they passed. But within about a month, the ants had carried off the entire bar, one tiny mouthful at a time. Why am I telling you this? Well, survival of the fittest does not mean survival of the strongest or the fastest or the smartest. The fittest means those who are best aligned with their environment, and environments change. So fittest means different things in different times, in different places. And in the four billion years of life on this planet, survival of the fittest has most often meant survival of the most cooperative. There is competition between individuals and between species, but survival is often a team sport. So cooperators almost always have an advantage. The worker ants moving that cricket in the video they're sterile. They have no chance of having baby ants of their own. They are working to support their sisters and nieces who will. Cooperation is the essence of every major advance in the complexity of life on Earth. In the eukaryotic revolution, single-celled bacteria engulfed but didn't digest their neighbors, and that benefited both of them. Those internal cooperators became essential organelles of our cells, like mitochondria and chloroplasts in plants. And then single cells cooperated to make the first multicellular organisms. And up until then, there were no organs, no blood, no stomachs or brains, no organs at all. So cooperation at that point allowed for specialization into tissues and organs. Later still, some of those multicellular creatures cooperated in societies like ants and elephants and people. The fossil record consistently reflects greater and greater scales of cooperation, building up in layers of biological complexity. Living things cooperate in larger and larger assemblies, and each time new potentials, new qualities can emerge. And all of this only happens if there's diversity. No evolutionary change can happen in a population if its members are all clones of each other. When there's diversity, natural selection has something to work with and promoting alignment with the environment and hindering misalignment. It's important to mention that natural selection works on populations, not individuals. 
The darker colored moth in this slide is just as likely to be eaten by a bat if both of them are flying. Or they both could have landed on a light colored birch tree and then the roles would be reversed. So the lesson here is not that some individuals are better than others. It's that diverse populations have more survival options, like a football team that's proficient in more plays or a musical group with a larger repertoire. And this is true with cultural evolution too. If we all spoke the same language, worshiped the same gods, ate the same foods, we would all be far less adaptable as the world changes around us. Diversity is a prerequisite for resilience. So cooperation and diversity are winning strategies in evolution. That's the science. What does that mean for us today? Well, as you know, there are dogmatic movements afoot in both politics and religion that oppose diversity, diversity of thought, of culture, of language, of our names for God, for goodness sake. They're present at both extremes of almost any kind of human spectrum you care to mention. I'm tempted to think that way myself sometimes. But how fragile I would be if my muscle cells started a movement to convert or kill all those inflexible boneheaded bone cells, right? If we want to survive, evolution suggests that we must find ways to cooperate within and across our diversity. Diversity of thought provides our grandchildren with options as they face a changing environment. And boy, are they facing a changing environment. Natural reality as science reveals it to us could be a source of great unity between the world's faith traditions. The work of science is done by representatives from every major faith tradition on the planet, and they share their process and their findings globally for all humanity to take inspiration from. More than nations or religious organizations or NGOs, more than any other human endeavor, science is people from every culture and nation and faith working together to reveal the secrets of creation. So whether you call it creation or physical reality, we meet and engage one another in this world. However, we might disagree about the nature and naming of transcendent realities, we generally agree that Earth is round, right? That DNA sequences guide the development of our bodies, that microscopic pathogens cause infectious diseases, and that devices based on quantum effects in tiny transistors work. The culture wars urge us to think of science as some kind of enemy of religion and spirituality. It claims that science reduces all magic and mystery to the mundane mud of materialism. Well, I got to tell you, the last 150 years in science have done just the opposite. Every discovery, every dark frontier illuminated reveals even greater mysteries beyond the shores of our knowledge. And with each new revelation, nature's glory and intricacy grow, sometimes by leaps and bounds. In me, they inspire an ever-expanding awe of the creative forces that birthed all of this. I think if the world's religions want to work together for the sake of future generations, they should start on common ground. Natural reality is the only literal common ground we have. And here we are, living in it as it. Such a beautiful flower, the evening primrose. So what if our sources of inspiration and spirituality included one that's based on what we know alongside what we believe? It includes my beliefs while also informing them. And it's true that sometimes new discoveries make us reconsider our beliefs in a new and more expansive light. That's a spiritual practice too. And for me, it's had powerful implications for who I am and for what's important to me. I think it could have powerful implications for others, too, and for interfaith dialogue. For example, how does the kinship of all living things resonate similarly or differently for Hindus and Muslims, for Jews and Taoists, for Jains and Christians, Mormons and pagans and atheists? 
What can they learn from one another once they go deeper than polite appreciation for each other's distinct beliefs and rituals? The fact of this kinship is something we all share because we are it. We are that kinship, that interbeing. I think that's a solid ground for supporting deep and authentic interfaith dialogue. Kinship is just one chapter of humanity's shared global scripture. There's so much more. When something is sacred, nothing can justify its destruction or desecration. I invite you to regard natural reality as holy scripture and to study what science reveals about it with that mindset. Approached with trust that studying nature can yield generous rewards, rigorous, earnest engagement with it to make it sacred, and doing so in community, global interfaith community. Natural reality, as science reveals it to us, could be the biggest, widest, most inviting bridge between faiths ever proposed. When we treat nature as sacred, knowing that our bodies are one with the whole of creation, we might just come to treat one another as sacred too. Sacred elements of a sacred planet, minuscule and precious in a vast and glorious cosmos. Thank you for tuning in today. It's been an honor to be here.